Polio. And this presentation is called Trauma Considerations for Children and Adolescents. Um, so I'm going to start by kind of defining trauma, talking about what it is into um, some treatments, uh, some resources for parents and caregivers, and then some time for questions in case anyone has any. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started uh, with just a broad definition of trauma. So a traumatic event is one that poses a threat um, or serious of serious injury or death uh, to oneself or someone else. Um, and it usually elicits feelings of intense helplessness or trauma. And there's, there's what they call big T traumas, and then there's little t traumas, which is not to say that um, some traumatic events are you know, less important or less traumatizing than others. So I think it can be very invalidating when we've experienced something that was for us, horrific. And for someone else to look at it and say, oh, that's not really that big of a deal. Um, so I, I kind of wanna, uh, don't wanna focus too much on um, what a big trauma is and what a little trauma is. Um, I think it's a little bit more helpful to think about acute, chronic, or complex. So acute meaning, not meaning that it's not a big deal, um, but rather that it's a single incident trauma. So we have someone who, um, has had a totally normal, uh, you know, wonderful life. And then um, one day they're in a, a car accident in which um, someone in their car, one of their passengers uh, dies. So uh, we would treat this as an acute trauma. We're treating um, the feelings that they have, uh, the emotions and uh, what's happened to their nervous system after. And then there's chronic trauma. And chronic trauma um, is something that happens repeatedly over a period of time. Uh, typically, we see that associated with um, people that have survived intimate partner violence. Uh, they experience many different traumatic events over, over a long period of time. And there's complex trauma. And complex trauma is when there's two different um, traumatic events or two different traumatic actors happening simultaneously. Um, we see that in kids that are growing up um, in poverty. Around a lot of events, although at home there might also be experiencing abuse. Um, so a couple of different things going on at the same time. We can also say uh, that someone has experienced complex trauma or has complex PTSD when they're an adult that experienced traumatic events in childhood and then separate traumatic events as an adult. So what causes trauma? Um, it's um, something that a lot of different people. In fact, I would say that. Probably all of us will experience a traumatic event in our lifetime. Life is dangerous and life has unsafe situations that can arise. Um, but sometimes when we experience a traumatic event, um, it can affect us uh, long after the event. And it, um, it can have kind of outsized effects on us. And it ends up being something that uh, we store we store our memory of the event in a way that's maladaptive. So it ends up deeply impacting the rest of our life. Uh, something that I hear a lot from parents or from caregivers or from teachers, and they're, they're well-meaning, but they might express that it seems like strong. And that's true, that's, uh, that's because we all will experience traumatic events. However, I think social media has a lot to do with it. Um, I saw this article on Slate last week that said, uh, how come everything on TikTok is a trauma response? And so I see people on TikTok saying, oh, these things are trauma responses. Um, and one of the one of the things was uh, wanting to keep your room clean. Well, that's not necessarily a trauma response, right? And I think that um, social media can be uh, really good in that it seems to have destigmatized. So people that have experienced trauma feel less alone. Uh, they feel like less of an outcast. But on the other hand, you get a lot of misinformation, um, like the example of cleaning your room as a trauma response. Of course, there's people who perhaps had an abusive caregiver that would force them to clean their room. And, uh, and now they like to keep their room tidy. But in general, generally speaking, being an organized person doesn't necessarily mean that you've experienced a trauma. I think that when with this kind of misinformation out there, my, Sorry, that's my cat doing anxiety. Uh, you know, oh, have I experienced a trauma because I like to keep my room clean? No, not necessarily. 
So what happens to the brain when we experience trauma? This is something that I like to talk about to all of my clients, whether they're uh, you know, my youngest client at four years old, um, all across the lifespan. Uh, there's obviously, there's many different parts of the brain. The brain is a complicated and beautiful machine. Um, but for our purposes, when we talk about trauma, we're gonna talk about two main parts of the brain. So I like to talk about the, part of the, the logical part of the brain, part of the brain that controls executive uh, level functioning. So the animal part of the brain is the first part of our brain to develop. It's the oldest part of the brain, and it's the part that controls uh, our emotional responses, and it also controls our fight or flight response. It's very powerful. And then as we get older, uh, we develop um, kind of our higher level thinking, and that is uh, that part of the brain is the front part. Um, the prefrontal cortex is the part that controls the higher level thinking. What gives you the ability to write an essay or do higher level mathematics? That's all right, right up here. Whenever we experience a trauma, um, our nervous system reacts very, very, very quickly, and it puts us in that fight or flight mode. Um, and that part of our brain can actually shut down uh, the logical part and um, kind of lets our animal part of the brain take over. You're flooded with emotion and you're flooded with hormones like adrenaline in case you need to fight something else off or in case you need to you know, run really fast. We can think about that and because they had to, right? Because uh, ancient humans had lots of danger coming at them all of the time. They had to be constantly on the on the defense or always ready to run away or always ready to fight, whatever the case may be. Um, but now we experience the trauma, we get flooded with these hormones. When we are safe, we might know logically that we're safe, but um, the animal part of the brain has, has shut down the logical part of the brain and is telling us that we still, we need to run away. Have that elevated status uh, where we are in, um, when we have the animal part of the brain that's taken over um, it, and it shut down the logical part of the brain, that's when we can see things like post-traumatic stress disorder start to occur. That's when we realize that the trauma has affected us negatively. It'll be something may have happened, you know, six months, a year in the past, but we're still uh, showing symptoms of, 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 as if the trauma had just happened. So symptoms, uh, and we're gonna talk about that tonight. Well, how does that look like in children? And see that um, usually when, when a trauma has been maladaptively stored, then we start using um, coping mechanisms that aren't necessarily very healthy. So um, oftentimes we see trauma disorders co-occurring with substance use disorders and things like that, because we're all trying to calm our systems down after we've experienced this, this horrific event. Uh, so something I wanted to bring up um, towards the beginning of the presentation uh, is a cultural consideration. When I was in grad school, we'd often talk about cultural competency as kind of an afterthought. Like, oh yeah, and, and these treatments might not work if you're from a different culture, something like that. Um, but I think, um, you know, as I've worked with different clients and I've had the privilege of working with clients from many different cultures have noticed that um, our culture isn't just limited, of course, to our race or ethnicity, but also to our religion or even our socioeconomic status. Um, something that is traumatic to someone um, might be traumatic to my neighbor, but it's not necessarily really traumatic how the neighbor copes with it. Um, and all of that is, a lot of it has to do with our culture. I think as practitioners um, or caregivers of children that have um, experienced a trauma, that's something important to keep in mind. Especially I've noticed when the trauma is centered around death and grieving, um, the way that my family or my household or, or my particular community um, copes with loss is going to look very different for other people. So something that we might, as clinicians, consider to be a trauma response. Uh, so let's look at how trauma impacts children directly. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's not going to be wildly different than how trauma impacts adults, um, but the way that they react to it is going to be it's going to be quite a bit different. According to the Encyclopedia of Stress, children uh, with increased psychosocial stress are significantly more likely to experience a variety of somatic diseases and hospitalizations. And so let's talk about that. Trauma in children 
and, and adolescents, and tweens. Often, if a child is uh, every day when it's time to go to school, if they're complaining of a stomach ache, I would think that there's probably something going on that they're not able to communicate. Um, they're not able to name the emotion, so and they haven't been able to process the trauma, so it's presenting as uh, having a stomach ache or a headache. Um, but also, this is also something that can be experienced culturally. Um, I'm a bilingual practitioner. And some of my Spanish speaking clients will often describe that. After it really affected me uh, that much beyond, um, beyond sometimes I experience attacks with my nerves, like um, nervous attacks with my nerves. Sometimes I have problems with my nerves. And that's kind of a somatic presentation of, of, a, traumatic, um, of a traumatic event. Children often, a, a really common symptom of a child that's experienced trauma is, uh, is nightmares, or more broadly speaking, changes in sleeping and eating patterns. In fact, we often see that children regress after a traumatic event. Maybe you have a five-year-old who's uh, wanting to sleep in their parents' bed. Uh, sometimes four or three-year-olds start asking to, um, or long, past the, long past the potty training phase um, act ask if they can start wearing diapers again. And uh, that is because they are feeling unsafe and they want to feel cared for. They remember feeling really cared for when they were a baby, so they're regressing to those behaviors. However, for a lot of parents, it can be really frustrating. You just get out of the potty training phase um, and then the child wants to regress. That's That's really difficult to for someone to start sharing a bed again and so sleeping independently. But uh, those kinds of changes in sleeping and eating and, and that regression is, is typically a result of trauma. Uh, children will often talk about bad dreams. We can really see uh, what a child is afraid of, uh, understand what the, what they've suffered, what they've what they've survived rather um, by by what their nightmares are about. Trauma also causes, uh, you know, undue wear and tear on the nervous system. Something that we look at a lot. Child experiences scale. People that score high on the ACE scale um, tend to be at a lot higher risk for um, for physical and mental uh, difficulty um, across the lifespan. So. Um, People who are clinically, have been clinically diagnosed as morbid obese, morbidly obese tend to have very high ratings on the ACEs scale, on the adverse childhood experience scale. So it starts out um, with a family of origin. It asks, whenever, whenever you administer the scale, it asks, uh, when you were a child, is a family member being abused? Um, did you have, uh, uh, did you grow up in a single parent home or did you have both? parents present in the house? Were any of your parents um, incarcerated? Did your parents suffer, suffer from mental illness? And also it asks questions specifically about the child. Um, when you were a child, were you often or very often uh, made to feel unsafe in your home? Were you told that, were you emotionally abused? Were you uh, physically or sexually abused? And the higher someone rates on that A scale, the more likely they are to experience uh, their uh, difficulties with their mental health, but also uh, their physical health um, later on in life. Whenever we think about how trauma impacts children, we also must ask, um, what do we want their futures to look like? For example, if they're a child that um, witnesses, <laughs> I apologize, I'm presenting from my home office. I'm sure many of you are also at home and I have a very needy cat right now. Um, when working with a child that has, for example, witnessed uh, um, domestic violence, violence um, they will, especially over a long period of time, they typically uh, begin to understand that that's how relationships work, um, that relationships are violent, that a loving relationship looks like this. Um, unless that child is able to process the trauma effectively, they might seek to replicate that relationship in their personal life as they get older. So let's talk about some behaviors that are associated with children who have experienced uh, trauma. I've grouped them into two, two broad, just challenging behaviors, which looks like, um, you know, getting physically angry or, uh, or physically fighting back. So uh, hitting, punching, kicking, getting into fights at school, um, using curse words, 
um, being generally disobedient. Oftentimes this accompanies a, an oppositional defiant disorder um, diagnosis, um, but not always. And then also we can see um, children who've experienced trauma ex uh, um, exhibiting behavior behaviors that are really more they're fawning, um, a child that's a perfectionist. Um, and when this can go too far in the opposite direction, it can lead to things like um, eating disorders or a child that um, self-harms. Um, and, and, and both of these are both of these types of behavior are signs that a child is experiencing or going back to that fight or flight mode. They are not safe. They don't feel safe, rather. They don't feel that they are safe. Um, so their, their nervous system is um, like they need to, uh, they still need to react, they still need to make sure that they're safe. Um, so that can often lead to, uh, not always, but whenever a child that's experienced a trauma comes in to, um, comes in to receive treatment, um, they might be diagnosed with a bunch of different things. Um, they could be diagnosed with acute stress disorder. If the trauma has occurred uh, recently within the past month, then there would be an acute stress disorder. If it's happened longer than that, if it was six months ago, a year ago, a year ago, a year ago a year. traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I mentioned complex PTSD earlier. Um, but sometimes a child is misdiagnosed because a lot of the behaviors that I mentioned on the previous slide, challenging behaviors or, uh, you know, anxious people pleasing behaviors can be um, can be misdiagnosed as oppositional defiant or as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, this is also because kids that have experienced trauma, and I, sh I should have listed this here, um, sometimes can behave as if they're in a day that they're not, play, not paying attention. Not always, of course, I'm not, uh, you know, ADHD is a separate diagnosis and some people exhibit those kinds of behaviors without ever having experienced a trauma. Um, but sometimes it can present that way. So it's really careful to avoid uh, misdiagnosing and to avoid um, punishing a child for a behavior that's associated with their trauma. Um, so that's something to look out for. Um, I'll move on to what some of it might So I am an EMDR therapist and I also use play therapy. Um, EMDR is, is, is fairly new um, and it's still kind of considered to be a newer treatment, but that is an evidence-based treatment. There's a lot of evidence that support EMDR's use uh, for, for treating trauma um, and even for treating children that have experienced trauma. So EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And um, it doesn't have to be eye movements, but uh, often times the pattern lectures will ask uh, the client to, um, to keep a traumatic event in mind and to uh, you know, follow our fingers, is kind of what we classically say. And you, you, they move their eyes back and forth, and uh, while keeping that treatment in mind, um, and it tends to, uh, or ideally, it will decrease the dis the level of disturbance uh, that the client feels while recalling this trauma. So you always will remember it. It doesn't remove it from your mind, but it does remember while talking about it. AMDR is an important treatment, especially because um, whenever we experience a trauma we tend to tell ourselves a story um, about that trauma. Um, whenever we experience an event in which we feel unsafe, we want to make sure we don't feel that way again, so we take a lesson from it. But sometimes, unfortunately, these lessons can be incorrect. Um, for example, uh, a child who is walking bitten by a stray dog, uh, that's a traumatic event. Um, the child might store this maladaptively as I can't be safe or my parents don't want to keep me safe um, until they're able to fully process the event. Um, they, that might be something that they tell about, about themselves. Um, and so we can understand for traumas that are, uh, that are more complex, such as being a survivor of, of sexual or physical violence, um, we might 
and tell ourselves that we have something wrong with us um, because we've experienced this or that we're we don't have value um, we don't we're not worthy of love and things like that so whenever we're looking for a treatment model uh, for someone that has experienced trauma it's important that the treatment is addressing um, the story that the person has has uh, decided or has uh, is believing about themselves as a result of the trauma um, play therapy is really, really helpful um, when treating trauma in children. Uh, usually between two and about nine, uh, but of course it can vary depending on a child's uh, developmental age. Play therapy um, can be extremely effective because um, in the playroom, we have all sorts of toys, but nothing electronic, um, and it allows the child to play through the situation of, of the traumatic event itself. Children learn through playing. That's how they learn. It's oftentimes often also how they communicate. Um, there's a there's a world-renowned play therapist who often gives the example of a child who's um, uh, baby brother drowned up so to come into the play therapy session every week and get out the baby doll and put the baby doll in the sink um, and, and pretend to be filling the sink with water and they would repeat that action until they no longer felt um, the those high levels of disturbance associated with the trauma um, of course it'll still be a distressing event there's no get, there's no way around it um, but sometimes what the children need in order to heal is to feel that they ended up making the right decision, whether it's saving the baby, but pulling the baby they're harmed or whether it's telling an adult right away that the baby is, is, um, is underwater, something like that. Um, we can also use um, dialectical behavior therapy to treat trauma. Uh, exposure therapy was one of the older uh, models of therapy. Um, older meaning that we've used it for a long time. But with exposure therapy, especially with children, it can sometimes be re-traumatizing. Um, it can sometimes do more harm than good. There's also a, a uh, high risk of trauma to the practitioner whenever they're using exposure therapy. So there's pros and cons associated with each of these treatment models. Let's look at what parents and caregivers can do to support treatment um, at their home or at school. Uh, one of the one of the biggest biggest factors in being able to predict um, a successful outcome of treatment for a child or adolescent that's experienced trauma is uh, whether or not they're able to live a stable, healthy lifestyle. So this does involve being able to go outside and get fresh air, get vitamin D, eating a balanced diet, and um, keeping to a routine. Now, this is something that I see a lot of parents and caregivers struggling with. Um, after a child has experienced a trauma, oftentimes parents want to um, allow them to, uh, you know, kind of get special treatment, I think. And I think that's a very natural impulse. Uh, you, the, the child has been through a lot and you want to um, kind of be less hard on them, you know, allow them to take it. Fortunately, um, this ends up, then this can end up backfiring and it can end up being harmful because having a predictable routine and being able to predict um, parents' reactions to behaviors is one of the, the main ways that a child can establish feelings of safety. Uh, if you, if, if one experiences a trauma, and then um, they go home and they uh, are, they talk back or something that is a rule in the household. They break a rule in the household. And their parents don't have to in the past, the child is gonna feel like everything has changed. You, you, you know, up is down and down is up. You can predict what's gonna happen. And that's gonna contribute to those feelings of, uh, of being unsafe. Um, Something that's a little bit controversial is uh, the use of pharm psychopharmaceuticals. It doesn't necessarily have to be controversial. Um, there's evidence that, of course, there's there's a large body of evidence that supports the use of psychopharmaceuticals in uh, treating trauma or treating children with um, uh, with a history of trauma. I'm a bit wary of, of their use. Uh, there's a lot of stigma associated with taking medications, um, but with uh, 
medication combined with therapy, combined with living, you know, a healthy, balanced lifestyle, a child tends to have uh, tends to have a very high, a, a very good indication that they'll be able to move through this uh, traumatic event, be able to process it successfully. Um, something that I should have listed here, but I didn't, uh, is also uh, trauma informed. Uh, that tends to work. Um, there's there's a, a high body of evidence uh, that supports the use of TFCBT um, in patients that have experienced trauma. So that's going to be your cognitive behavioral therapy in which a practitioner um, explore, explores uh, the relationship between someone's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors while applying a, uh, a trauma-informed lens. Um, this tends to be helpful for patients that um, tend to enjoy talking, that need to go to a therapist and really explore and sort out their problems. And this is gonna be, uh, as opposed to EMDR, which is a more scripted, um, less flexible protocol, I would say, wherein you're focusing directly on the dramatic event and how it made you feel. TFCBT tends to take a little bit longer, but it allows them to really go deep, for lack of a better term, on, on all the things that they might um, that might be experiencing. So let's talk about some coping mechanisms that you can use outside of um, outside of the treatment room. Uh, so something that I really like to use a uh, a visual that I like to use is called smelling and cooling hot chocolate. So uh, with an adult, I might say uh, taking really deep inhales through your nose and exhaling through your mouth. Um, but for, for a kid, it's a good idea to use something um, that they have, you know, maybe a positive association um, and get a, a really strong mental image of. So if you're if you're holding, you know, hot chocolate, I'm holding a glass of water, but it would be nice if it's hot chocolate um, and encouraging the child to pretend that they're smelling. So taking a really deep, profound inhale through the nose, and then cooling it, so, so exhaling through the mouth. Um, that also helps to uh, get a mental image of a cup of hot chocolate, and that helps to um, allow the mind to, um, the, the, out, the animal part of the brain to kind of step back a little bit, um, since it's really elevated, and allow the logical part, the part that controls um, Uh, you need to kind of step in because we're asking the child to imagine holding a cup of hot chocolate. And if your emotions are really high and you're dysregulated, imagining something else or being able to have kind of a sensory experience of something else is um, really helpful to, to re-regulate. Um, I see in a lot of classrooms and early childhood classrooms now, um, teachers utilizing a calm down space. I think that's a really great idea a place that a child can go, um, that they have positive associations with, a place for them to kind of gather their thoughts before they kind of move back into, into the classroom environment. I think it's also totally appropriate to have a place that's designated for that in your home. Uh, whether it's a living room, something like that, uh, but a place that a child knows that they can go when they just need to take a breather. And maybe that can signify to the rest of the family that, okay, um, you know, Johnny needs a second to calm down. So we're gonna let him calm down. And whenever he's ready to rejoin the family or rejoin what everybody else is doing, he's welcome to do so. Oh, how embarrassing. I uh, have a typo on the word. It should be correction. Ironically, it's missing the scene, um, but connection before correction. So um, earlier, I stated the importance of maintaining a rule, uh, maintaining routines, rules, and expectations in the home or in the classroom um, after a child has experienced a trauma. It's also really important to, before we enforce the rule or before we, you know, certainly before we, um, before we decide that a punishment needs to take place, um, we need to build that connection first. Uh, recognize that a child who's you know, behaving really disruptively, who's um, hitting and kicking, uh, it's important that we take a second and connect with them. Say, it looks like you're experiencing really hard emotions. Like, you know, but depending on the child, they might say yes, they might say no, whatever. Um, but just acknowledge that you see them and you notice that they're in pain and you're going to uh, kind of sit with them in that space of pain and sit with them for a second before you, you know, correct the behavior. 
This is really helpful because it helps the client uh, name the emotion, name, the child rather, name the emotion. Um, there's kind of a phrase in, in therapy with children that say, name it to tame it. So if we're able to say, you know what, I'm acting really, I'm being angry right now. I'm angry right now. And I'll step outside of the animal mind that's taken over and kind of let our logical mind step in for a second, recognize what we're experiencing. And then it's a little bit easier to get to uh, decrease from the dysregulated, that heightened state to kind of uh, be able to get to a place where we're feel, feeling more calm. I'm a big fan, especially uh, when working with teenagers of using 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 census. Um, so that's when, uh, whenever we recognize that we're in uh, the first step would be to recognize that we're in a heightened state, that we're upset, that we're uh, from a place of emotion or a place of intense fear. And um, using our senses to help us, uh, it's, it's a mindfulness skill in order to help us orient to the present and help us feel more safe. So that starts with a five, it's going to be five things that you can see. Uh, four things that you can touch, three things that you can hear, uh, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Um, so any room that they're in, this is a really amazing tool because it can be done anywhere. Um, you don't need. You can do it in a classroom. You can uh, remember to do it when you're when you're in a, when you're in a car when you're uh, when you're at home. Really anywhere. And um, it, it obviously doesn't require any kinds of props, but it really allows us to orient to the present and thus feel um, that we can be safe. We're not kind of trapped into the, in the memory of the traumatic event anymore. Um, it's also important, even though um, it feels uh, logically like uh, whenever a child or teenager in that kind of state, um, it might feel like that's the natural time and place to kind of teach a lesson to kind of say, oh, you're, uh, you know what, I think that it would be a really good idea if we learn from this and do X, Y, and Z. But whenever we're in a heightened state, uh, if I'm very upset, if I'm very stressed out, that's not really the place where I can learn. Uh, that's not really the place that I learn from. I'm, I'm in, an, uh, my emotions are running high. And I'm not able to stay, take a step back. So the first thing to do uh, before the lessons, before the correction, again, is going to be to use mindfulness, uh, take a deep breath, calm down a little bit, make that connection, name the emotion um, before we move on to how we can use this as a learning opportunity. Um, so when I'm working with parents or caregivers, um, questions that they ask frequently um, are how soon will it get better or how long is this going to take and um, it's perfectly natural to want to know that we want to make sure our children or our loved ones are you know feeling better as soon as possible um, and the uh, unfortunately an answer uh, but the answer is it depends it depends on the level of stability in the child or teenager's life at the moment it depends on whether they're able to uh, feel safe. It depends on whether or not they are surrounded by memories of the traumatic event or the traumatic person are oftentimes uh, or, or uh, better known as, as triggers. It depends on how often they're exposed to triggers. Um, the best way to support uh, the therapeutic process is, as I mentioned on a previous slide, um, helping the child or teenager maintain that healthy lifestyle, making sure that they're getting adequate sleep, that they're uh, able to get outside, get some exercise, an appropriate amount, making sure that they're eating well. Um, how do we set expectations and milestones without pushing too hard? That's a really good question. Um, sometimes parents who are, you know, incredible parents we can be pushing the child a little bit too far. Um, we kind of see this, I've seen uh, this being described as kind of toxic positivity. Um, and that's very, that's, that's a very difficult conversation to have. But if a child is, is feeling down about the trauma, and they, you know, they want to talk to the parent about it, and the parent just says like, oh, you need to just put that behind you. You need to get past it. You need to stop thinking about it so much. You need to, you need to move forward. Well, the child, unfortunately, is going to feel, uh, 
pretty invalidated by that because it's still a big part of their life. Um, this is a difficult thing to do. It tends to have better results if you uh, allow yourself again to sit with the child or the teenager in that space, uh, to sit with them in the pain, the bad feeling, or the yucky feeling. Trauma can be so isolating. You can really feel like, uh, like you're the only person in the world that's gone through this, or that no one feels worse than you do, especially when you're a child or you're a teenager. So having someone, uh, someone that you love and trust um, sitting with you and sharing that and uh, kind of shouldering that burden with you for a little bit can be, it, 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 it can really be, you know, it can really change your world. It can be a, a, exactly what you need. Um, a question that I also get is what, um, you know, it's, it's uh, in Texas, any adult that even suspects that a child or teenager person under 18 years old is being um, abused or exploited is required by law to report it um, to uh, CPS. You can report it online. You can report it by phone. Uh, if you Google uh, make a report or Texas CPS report, it'll, it'll pop up immediately. Um, that's something that we need to remember. I think a lot of times people think Like, oh, well, hurt. Um, but you might be the only person that does get involved and um, that can you know, really change someone's life for the better by making that report. Um, I also wanted to make sure I had some time to go over some resources that people can use. Um, I'm a big fan of, of using books. Um, and there's a really wonderful book uh, for children called A Terrible Thing Happened. It's by Margaret M. Holmes. And um, it's for kids who witness violence or trauma. And then for books for, for parents or caregivers, by Cynthia Monahan, there's Trauma Through uh, a Child's Eyes uh, by Peter Levine, who has written many, many books um, starting in the 1970s about trauma and trauma treatment. And then you can also find really helpful YouTube videos. Um, however, just like, just like everything on the internet, it's, it's really important to be able to identify the source of who's putting out the YouTube videos um, because there can be a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of misinformation, bad information out there. Um, but I think here that's by an institute that treats um, children who've experienced trauma. So typically I would say, you know, if you're looking for a YouTube video, look at uh, who put out the video, who uploaded it, and if they're associated with a, with an organization or with a private practice even, then their information will probably be a lot better than someone who's, you know, got kind of like a silly username and doesn't have any other helpful information in their, in their, uh, in the description. And then, of course, other websites that you can use in Houston, um, uh, the, the Children's Assessment Center at cachouston.org is the absolute best resource um, for children and sexual abuse. Um, anyone can go at any age, actually, um, even adults who, uh, if, if they had experienced sexual abuse as a child, you can go there for therapy, um, for family advocates. Um, it's it's a it's a really it's a really wonderful wonderful place. So is Bose Place. This uh, Bose Place and the CAC are both free resources. Bose Place is for children and families that have experienced grief. Uh, they do uh, free uh, therapy, um, and they also have like a lot of events. Um, it's it, it can be really helpful and powerful for children and adolescents to go to. the same things that they have because again trauma can be very isolating um there's also the trauma and grief center in houston they used to be part of texas children's hospital i think but now they are part of a different organization they have uh this link here has a ton of free resources they have um webinars and literature available for parents and caregivers that are looking to um, learn how to work with their children or adolescents that have experienced trauma um, and then there's the National Center uh, for, for traumatic, stress, traumatic Stress in Children. And then there's also the 
um, American Psychological Association has um, a great page where they talk about how to talk about traumatic events uh, with your child. Um, and then uh, here's my resources. I wanted to uh, close uh, with some time left to answer questions. And I also realized I did not um, properly introduce myself. I'm Maggie Burkett Zagilova. I am a therapist. I worked for a long time as a, a doing social work as a community in community outreach. And um, before I got my master's, I was actually first in Houston Independent School District. I taught school language first grade, um, so Spanish and English. And that's when I really became um, very interested in how traumatic events can impact um, cognition. All of the children that I worked with, either they themselves were immigrants from Central America or their parents were, and they'd experienced um, significant trauma in early childhood. And um, I decided that I, you know, I really wanted to uh, to get my master's and work with this population. And so I'm proud to say that that is what I've done ever since. Um, what can I answer? Looks like we don't have any questions tonight. Uh, Marcus, did you have anything you wanted to ask or that you wanted me to clarify? Uh, no, Maggie, um, you know, one last thing. We do have a feedback form that I put into the uh, the chat box. If y'all could all please just uh, fill it out. Uh, help us create uh, more and better pro, um, you know, presentations for y'all. So if you could just get that filled out real quick. But that's about it for me. That would be really helpful. Um, guys, I really appreciate your time tonight. If there's no questions, and I think we can end and get out of here a little bit early. Um, I believe my contact information should be in the... Um, in the feedback box. Um, if not, I'll make sure that uh, you'll receive it. Thank you, uh, Mercedes. And um, I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions or any feedback, or if you might like to work together and collaborate. Um, I really think that um, when it comes to trauma treatment, uh, it's a little cheesy, but I always think that um, the human capacity to to harm one another is 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 vast, but it's matched only capacity. I think things will only get better if we work together. So uh, please don't be shy to reach out. I look forward to hearing from you or working with you in the future. And thank you all for the opportunity. Good night.